And that was, that was awesome. That remind me of the fat boys in, in the 80s. Do y'all, do y'all even know who the fat boys are? If you know who the fat, other than us old people, do you young people know who the fat boys are? You know how like, uh, I know y'all not supposed to listen to future, but I know y'all do. How they be like, Brr! we used to be like, <laughs> we used to do that kind of stuff. So I, uh, I, I truly, truly felt at home. Uh, before I dive into my message, um, I want to look at black African Christian history before we go forward, because oftentimes we think that uh, people of African descent became Christians when they came to America, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, There's this book called the Book of Acts. It's about the Acts of the Apostles. And in Acts chapter 8, there was this Ethiopian eunuch. You guys know what a eunuch is? How do you get that job and why do you want it? That's like the worst job. So this Ethiopian eunuch was, was, was reading the book of Isaiah and the Holy Spirit brought Philip along and he had a moment where he met Jesus and he was baptized immediately and, and so he goes back to Ethiopia. Did you know that some of the oldest churches in the world are in Ethiopia? Let me introduce you to a person by the name of Athanasius. Uh, back in the third century, there was this huge church fight going on. Uh, and there was this one guy who wanted to deny the Trinity, and there was this other guy by the name of Athanasius who continuously taught, no, the Scripture teaches that, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. He actually got put in prison, and a derogatory term about Athanasius was this. They called him the Black Dwarf. You know why? Because he was dark. Darkness. Let me tell you about St. Augustine. You guys ever heard of him, St. Saint, Saint Augustine? Yeah, we're like, okay, we know, we know St. Augustine. He, he, he African too. Did you know that? Did you know that in 1619, when 4,000 Africans were enslaved, by the way, I never used the term slaves for people who were African. Slave is your identity. Enslaved is the injustice that happened to you. 4,000 of them were Christians. Did you know that? 4,000. So let us understand that history, Christianity, by the way, all of history is his story. King Jesus, Messiah, within his story, every nation, tribe, and tongue has their little bit story, their little small story. But the big story is uh, uh, black history, particularly as Christians, our legacy of being Christians Uh, didn't start when we were quote-unquote enslaved. By the way, by the way, I got a conundrum here. So I was messing around a few years ago. I took a DNA test, y'all. Because my uh, my mom is as light-skinned as some of y'all Caucasian folks. And my aunt has blonde hair and green eyes. I was like, huh, I'm going to do a little DNA test. So I did the little spit thing, sent it off to wherever they'd send it, got something in the mail. I was confused for like three days. I am 22% European. So I like to say that I'm a black Scotsman. I don't to come out in a kilt like William Wallace of Braveheart. Let's pray, y'all. Let's let's, let's. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus and through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, I want to thank you for being good. I want to thank you for being great. Specifically, I want to thank you for every student that is under the sound of the gospel that is about to be proclaimed, that hearts and minds would be open and receptive to the goodness of Jesus, the greatness of Jesus the excellencies of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, that we would be soaked and saturated. We would be overwhelmed with the beautiful person of Christ Jesus. Would you do that, Holy Spirit, to the glory of the Father? In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. I am very hopeful for your generation. Like, I'm not, I'm not real big into labels. I guess you guys are Generation Z or, or, or whatever. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know, but, but I'm really hopeful for y'all. And here's why. I think for those of you who particularly have grown up in the church, uh, um, you just don't want to do Jesus like the people you've seen do Jesus. Um, I believe that you are longing 
and hungry for something more. Uh, um, um, I believe that uh, um, you want what Gandalf offered Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit. Do y'all remember when, when uh, Gandalf rolled up on the scene? He like nine foot 12. And he tells Bilbo, listen to this now. He says, I'm looking for someone to share an adventure with, but it's hard to find people these days. I think you're the generation that Jesus is saying, I'm looking for someone to share an adventure with. Do you want to join me? And I believe you're the generation to do that. And one of the primary reasons that you want to do that is you've seen. Like America is not in a shortage of big churches that are really cool. But last I checked, a big cool church doesn't stop a race riot. Last I checked, oftentimes big school churches don't talk about racial injustice. When was the last time any of you guys heard your pastor preach on this? Did you know that Wells Fargo, and this is real, made millions of fake accounts to cook the books for false prophets and no one goes to jail? But if one of you little brown-skinned persons in here have $10 worth of weed, you're going under the jail. But yet if you're rich and you've got the right lawyers, you can be guilty and be set free. But there are prisons today where people are innocent who couldn't afford a lawyer who are in prison. When was the last time you heard that preach? Because of a Jesus that just sends you to heaven but does not bring heaven to earth is not the Jesus of the Bible. We are playing games. We are a generation of love. We are not salt and light. Are y'all with me? Did I go too fast? Did I jump in? They didn't give me a lot of time. Um, they only gave her brother like 30 minutes. I'm black, so that's the warm-up. So I got to go right to it. So, 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 no, I'm not going to do that because I'm tired. <laughs> no, no, I ain't doing that, Doc. Um, so why I'm hopeful is because you haven't been jaded yet. You haven't been jaded yet. Your parents used to dream like you. They used to want to change the world, then they got a mortgage. They used to want to change the world, then they became a part of the system. They used to change the world, but then they settled that, you know, Jesus is just good on Sunday, but he's not really going to affect my career. I'm just going to kind of go through the motions. But where I want to talk about is this, is, is we live in a time... In my 48 years of living, we live in a time that I have never seen so much ugliness from Christians. Now, I expect non-Christians to be crazy. You know why? Because for 26 years of my life, I was a non-Christian and I was crazy. So I expect that. But God's people, oh my, but God's people. Research shows this, and I wrote over 47,000 words in my doctoral thesis to prove this. Research shows that the most divided people in America are black Christians and white Christians. Not atheists and agnostics and Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. No, black Christians and white Christians are more divided than anybody. Like we share the same resurrection blood. We read the same sacred scripture, but we are the most divided. How in the world can an unbelieving world say, we want to follow your Jesus? You guys are so divided. It is awesome. So much division, so much brokenness. You're the generation that can be peacemakers. All right, I'm going to hit you with some here, and I need you to marinate on it, all right? Your happiness and God's glory through your life go hand in hand. Your happiness and God's glory for your life go hand in hand. Now, some of you are like, Pastor, what you talking about? Don't worry. Hey, don't tell anybody. I got two doctorates, y'all. So I'm about to exegete the text, all right? So don't worry about it. I know you little internet preacher said, Happiness ain't, uh, I get that. 
But let's, let's talk to Jesus. Jesus in Matthew does something profound. He goes to a hill looking over the Sea of Galilee. I've been there. It's dope. And, and, and Jesus, like the great rabbi he is, sits down. And he's still looking over the sea of our lives, asking us to sit down and listen. And he begins to go through what we call the Beatitudes or, or this word blessed. And I'm going to focus on verse 8 that says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. Now you're like, preacher, where's the happiness? Where's the happiness? Whoop, here it is. The word for blessed in Greek is the Greek word mercurios. And guess what it means? Happy. See, but it's not the happiness that you think or I think. You see, you and I have been conditioned to think that happiness is good things happening to us. You ready for this? You ready for this? But for Jesus, his kind of happiness is not good things happening to us. It's a good God transforming us. Happiness is you becoming someone, not necessarily where you're going, it's who you're becoming. And Jesus is saying, you want to be happy? You want to be happy? You want to be blessed? You want to be mercurious? Become a peacemaker, for you will be called sons and daughters of God. Now notice, Jesus didn't say this. Now, I can read a little Hebrew, a little Greek. Jesus didn't say this. Blessed are those who advocate like they're crazy for political parties. I haven't read in the New Testament where Jesus is like, hey, disciples, listen. When we get the right people on the Supreme Court, whoa, this little movement of ours is going to change the world. Do y'all remember that? Jesus wasn't like Bernie Sanders in the three houses he owned. By the way, how can you be a communist and own three houses? That's another time for another discussion. <laughs> I, I, no, no, seriously. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I mean, facts don't matter, but never mind. <laughs> Let me continue. Uh, um, what Jesus did is he said, I'm bringing an alternative kingdom to the world. And people in this kingdom are happy people because they are peacemakers and they will be called sons and daughters of God. One of the ways that you know someone is rolling with Jesus, translation from our Caucasian brothers and sisters, how do you know someone is walking with Jesus in a covenantal relationship? <laughs> They're peacemakers. They're peacemakers. Jesus says, happy are the peacemakers for they will be called sons and daughters of God. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through this one text and, and, and I want us to marinate in it and we're going to look at it upward, we're going to look at it inward, and then we're going to look at it outward. First of all, what does peacemaking mean that brings us happiness? Well, it's rooted, Jesus is a Jew, it's rooted in the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom is is God's peace. Shalom is, is God's kingdom. Well, but here's the problem, though, for you and the problem for me. That in order to be in relationship with the Prince of Peace, we have to remove this broken nature we have called sin. Now, I know not everybody here is a follower of Jesus yet, but here's the reality. All of us are born sin. That's, all of us are born in sin. Jesus didn't come to make dead, uh, bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And so the reality is, one out of one people die. When I was your age, I never thought about death. Ever. At 48, I'd be like, dang, 10 years, that's 58. 68, he gone. <laughs> so, so, so all of us have been affected by this this terrorist called death. Death is not God's original intent. But, but then also, this, this nebulous word called sin. Now, now, we know the technical term is an archer shoots an arrow and if he misses the mark, he says sin. Well, well, well sin is this. Sin is this. I am trying to find love and satisfaction in anything other than Jesus. It's not, I just did a little boo-boo. 
It's actually cosmic treason. That there is a king who says, I know what's good for you. I want to love you. I want you to know me. I, I want to make you happy. And it's not based on your happenings. It's based on what's happening inside of you. Yeah, we can clap about that. That was good right there. That was good. Yeah, there we go. All right. Black people, help the white people. Now clap. That's what we have to do at our church too. Our church is like 58% white. I'm like, white people, you can beat the black people and the Latinos clapping. You can do it. <laughs> now, hey, hey, you connect with God however you see fit. That's between you, you and the Lord. So, so, so we have this issue where we're not at peace with God. But what does God do? When I say God, I mean a loving father, which I didn't have. And maybe some of you didn't have. My, my dad was 19 when I was born. That's, that's some of y'all's ages. My dad had brain health issues. My dad was an addict. And so I'm no longer angry with him. I, I have compassion for him. But, but, but our father is a good, good father. What does a good, good father do? He sends his good, good son, Jesus, to be a peace offering for you. So understand this. God is saying, I want you to really know me. Um, um, intimacy stands for into me you see. God is saying, I am the God of peace and, and I want to have peace with you. Uh, I want to roll with you. I want to be your best friend. I, I want to be your guide. Now listen, young pe people, this is, this is really important. There are going to be some things in your life that happens that makes you and I both question, does God love me? Whenever that happens, and it will happen, unfortunately, but when it happens, always look to the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is always God's final verdict on if you are loved or not. On that bloody, rugged cross, he said you are eternally loved, and Jesus became your peace offering. So check this out. I grew up in the hood. Um, I got a football scholarship, y'all. Any, any, anybody here ever heard of Brigham Young University? It's in Provo, Utah. It's very diverse. Different kinds of whiteness. <laughs> white Mormons everywhere. Brother from the hood at a white mountain school. It was great. It was awesome. It, it, it was, though. It was. It was great. So I go to BYU. Didn't grow up going to church. For me, my peace was going to happen as... Okay, I'm going to get a degree. Maybe I'm good enough to go to the NFL. After my sophomore year, y'all, I went nuts. I led the conference in interceptions. I was a bad boy back in the day, right? And so junior year, senior year, man, I get drafted. And I'm like, I did it finally. But after three years of being in the NFL, team captain, beautiful wife, houses, cars, money, all the stuff, I, number one, didn't have peace with myself, nor did it bring the peace that I thought it was going to bring to my family because $1,000 wasn't enough, one car wasn't enough, paying this bill wasn't enough, nothing was ever enough, and here's why. Money cannot fix a broken heart. Only the great physician can fix a broken heart, and his name is Jesus. I had a teammate, his name was Steve Grant. His nickname was the Naked Preacher. He was a black dude, 6'2", 40. Every day after practice, he'd take a shower, dry off, wrap a towel around his waist. And he'd walk throughout the locker room saying, do you know Jesus? And he'd go, no, seriously, I'm not making this up. And in my mind, because I'm unchurched, I'm like, do you know you're half naked? <laughs> so literally... I tried to avoid him at all costs, and eventually one day he came to my locker half naked, and I'm like, oh, here comes this chocolate man half naked. I don't want him, his Jesus, none of this nakedness. This is just weird. And then one day he tapped me on the back, Rookie D. Gray, do you know Jesus? And I began a five-year process. Now listen, this is really important. God had to strip me of everything before he gave me everything. And the everything isn't stuff, it's a person, it's himself. So my body was how I made my living. Like, I'm not bragging, but as you get older, I look at pictures. I'm like, honey, why you didn't tell me I look like that? She's like, why you think I was with you, baby? <laughs> no, seriously, I had 4% body fat. My abs had abs. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But, but all of a sudden... 
my knees start getting messed up, ankles start getting messed up. Um, and, and then when you start getting hurt in the NFL, NFL stands for not for long. So I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. I got a 16 on my ACT to get in to, be, to BYU. So I'm like, I'm just a dumb stuttering football player. What can I do if I can't play this game anymore? I had to deal with my own moral failings. I knew I needed things to be forgiven for, but no matter how many good deeds I tried to do, that feeling was still there. And on August 2nd, 1997, in a small dorm room in Anderson, Indiana, at Anderson College there, is where I came to Jesus. I picked up the phone. Now, y'all gonna laugh at this. The phone was attached to the wall with a cord. And it was, you go, and I called my wife and I said, I want to be more committed to you and I want to be committed to Jesus. And that's when I knew for the first time in my life I was loved, not because I was strong or fast or I played football. I was loved at my worst and God gave me his best. And it was Jesus. That's when I begin to understand this peace. So, so, so that's upward. On the count of three, say upward with me. One, two, three. Upward. Jesus is our peace offering. But then inward. How do you know? How many of you know that once you come to faith in Christ, you still got to work through issues? Oh my goodness, please let me get a hold of you now. And I know your teachers and, and your pastors are doing a good job, but let me get a hold of you now. Deal with your trauma now so it doesn't deal with you and cause you to burn a marriage at 42. I have these meetings all the time and when I'm counseling and, I, and these are Christians and I'm talking to them, I go, the problem isn't your husband. You're mad at that guy. Have you ever heard this? People go to therapy because they interact with people who refuse to go to therapy. Did I go that too fast? Let Jesus deal with your trauma now. Listen, knowing the Bible is different from knowing Jesus. You can know the Bible and not know Jesus. The Bible doesn't give you eternal life. Jesus gives you eternal life. The Bible points to Jesus. John chapter 5, verses 39 through 40, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, you check the scriptures daily because you think they will give you eternal life, but the scriptures testify to me, but you won't come to me. You can know him. You can experience him. You can feel his grace. He can deal with your trauma. He can do it. You know why? Because he overcame sin. He overcame death. He overcame evil. He moonwalked on the Sea of Galilee. He cast out demons. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the Great I Am. And let me tell you something. I'm being really bold today. If you're not hearing preaching like this, leave. The last thing you need is a TED talk, a self-help talk, a Jimmy Fallon act. We need Jesus. We need his power. We need his grace. I don't want to be cool. I want holiness. Let's make holiness great again. Seriously. God's people are out here looking for a word and we got comedy routines. We need the king. Let him deal with your trauma, please. Bring it to him. And here's the wonderful thing. Here's the wonderful thing. He already knows. And his nail pierced hands are extended. Come to me. Come to me. Let me heal you. And here's the thing. There are some things in your life and my life that will never be healed. And that eternal ache is a foresign to the day that it won't be so again. On the count of three, say inward. One, two, three, inward. He wants us to have peace. Listen, you can't have peace with anybody else if you don't have peace with yourself. Let's look at outward now. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. Let me ask you a question now. I have a 23-year-old. I know you're shocked. She's majoring in psychology. She's crushing it. She's like her mom, doing great. Not perfect, like any of us. None of us are. Don't you hate it when preachers get up? Well, you know, my kids were levitating and praying in tongues in Arabic in their mother's womb. 
Matter of fact, the baby healed the mom in the womb. Uh, I got a I got a 19 year old son as well, and this is what we've tried to model for them imperfectly. But how's the world going to be different because you exist? Now, you don't have to be a superstar to make a difference. There are everyday, ordinary people who are making the world different. You ever heard of Mrs. Terrell? She was my second grade teacher at Ira Ogden Elementary. You ever heard of Coach Bill Took? He was my eighth grade coach who always believed in me. You ever heard of OCB Gillum? That, that's, that's my grandmother who said, baby, I believe in you no matter what. Even when I was like, Granny, I want to be a football player. I got cut from my first football team I tried out for at nine years old. I was a second string guard in eighth grade. I only started one year of high school. So, so, so don't think you have to be uh, the best. Like, we don't want to do Ricky Bobby theology. Do you know, know, y'all know what Ricky Bobby the- theology is? Yes. So if you're second, you're first, last. There's a lot of great things you can do with second. So here's my question for you that I present to my kids. And as the body of Christ, as followers of Jesus, let me ask you this. As you are pursuing your career, is it your career or is it your sacred task? Because a career is one in which you're just going to go make money. There, there, there is a lot of believers who have sacrificed their sacred task or calling at the altar of a career so that they could buy more stuff, go on more vacations, do more things, and are miserable. Have you heard God whisper to you, this is what I want to do in you and through you. This is how I want to transform the world. And once again, one of the things we do as Christians, it's wrong. Every follower of Jesus is a minister and missionary. You have a ministry in the local church and you're a missionary outside of the local church and how that expresses itself, that's wonderful. Some of you may be directors in Hollywood. Some of you may be teachers and firemen or whatever it may be. I don't know what you should do, but I know the one who's calling you to be a peacemaker in the world. Question. Question. As you go about How are you going to make peace? Because right now, this is the highest and most volatile racial tensions I've ever seen in America. How are you going to make peace? Let me give you a couple of suggestions. You ready? You may want to write this down. Number one, number one. You ready? This is this this right here deep, y'all. Treat everybody like Jesus died for them because he did. Hebrews 2.9, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Jesus tasted death for everyone. How would that change our posture if we begin to see that Jesus tasted death for everyone? And the ability to see that way is to remember Jesus tasted death for you. The way you and I treat people is actually a mirror into our souls about how we feel about ourselves. Number two, seek to understand before being understood. Okay, I'm going to throw a little gasoline here, but I feel like we're brothers and sisters, okay? So um, I've been to Germany, and when I go to Germany, I don't see any statues of Adolf Hitler. I don't see anything of the German Nazi heinousness. No signs of it anywhere. Everybody follow me? But yet in some parts of America, we will have symbols that say, no, this is about my heritage in the South. And my thing is, well, 
didn't the Confederacy not want to be Americans? Hold on, are, are y'all still there? Because last I checked, the Confederacy fought to not be a part of America. Is that true? Is that, I mean, y'all, y'all college kids, is that right or wrong? Y'all like, yeah, okay. No, no, think, seriously. So why would we glamorize a symbol that enslaved, raped, and murdered and didn't want to be a part of America? I hope you're white clapping over there. No, seriously, think about it. Don't just accept it. How do you tell a fish that it lives in water? Sometimes you got to get pulled out. I'm pulling you out right now. Because as African Americans and Latinos and, and other minorities, when they see those flags and it doesn't bother you, you got to go, I love my brother and sister, sisters enough to know, you, does that bother you? Well, why? Man, that makes sense. Go ahead, go ahead, clap, homie. Don't be scared. Lead the way. See, but that's what love does. It's called the incarnation. Love came down. Seek to understand before being understood. Number three, how do you treat people who can't do nothing for you? That's a litmus test of our capacity to love. Please, young people, don't fall into the trap of using other human beings. Things are meant to be used. People are created to be loved. But we use people and love things. How do we treat people who can't do anything for us? By the way, who did Jesus hang out with the most? Like, like the A, the A list that would be on the red carpet at the Oscars. Think about the people that Jesus hung out with. How do we treat the least of these among us? You know, so for us at Transformation Church, we, we are unashamedly pro-life, but for us, pro-life is from the womb to the tomb. Once the baby comes out, we don't go, peace, all right, good luck to you, God bless. No, no, we, we provide education, clothing, financial assistance, you, you know, the whole thing. So treating another human with dignity and respect is being pro-life. So let me ask you, and we're going to get ready to wrap this up. As you think about this great world-class education you're getting, you're learning from great professors, got great mentors, and there's a great big old world that has hurts and needs. How does what you do going to fix those hurts and those needs? Now, that doesn't mean everyone's called into full-time vocational ministry, but all of us are in full-time ministry. I believe in this generation. You haven't been jaded. You see the failures of what's gone before us. You are my hope. Like when, when I equip other pastors about planning a multi-ethnic diverse church, I'm not talking to, I'll talk to guys and gals my age, but it's, but it's y'all. You are the future, and the future started yesterday. Presley's my oldest, Jeremiah's 19. When Presley was about two years old, that's when we started dating. So we started dating. Um, why did I date my daughter? Because I wanted her to know what it was like for a man to treat a lady with honor and respect. By the way, ladies, if you let a guy treat you like you're worth you five cents, he will. You're valuable. You're valuable. And fellas, the same thing for you as well. Treat yourself like you're an image bearer of Christ Jesus. So we go out on dates, and we did it all the way up through high school. We still do it from time to time. She would travel with me to preach, all types of stuff. And so that's a tradition I had with her. I had a tradition with my son. So my son, uh, his name is Jeremiah, but his nickname is Big Bull because dude's always been big. So like right now he's 19, 6'2", 215, like he's, he's just big. So when he was a little boy, when I would get home from trips, I'd go through the garage, get in the living room, and I would say, Big Bull! Thousand one. Thousand two. At a thousand three. 
Can you hear them big old giant feet? Like he had size 14 shoes in eighth grade. It was ridiculous. So you, you so, so, so like you hear those big old feet. And then he would say these words, and I'm not doing preacher hyperbole. He would, he would say these words. He would say, Daddy's home. And that was more exciting than when any crowd ever booed me or when the opposing team booed me even louder and my home team cheered me. He would say these words, Daddy's home. And I spread my arms. I can't do this now because he'd kill me. I, I, I spread my arms and he'd just run to me. Boom! I grab him and hold him. And at this time, he'd let me grab his face. I kiss him and I say, son, your father loves you. I say, son, no matter what you do in your life, your father loves you. You know why? Because you're my son. My love for you is unconditional. No strings attached. I got your back. Whatever you want to do, man, I, I love you. I'm here for you. My son was one of the top defensive backs in the whole United States of America. He played at a high school called Charlotte Christian. He was phenomenal, got recruited by everybody. Because education was important to us, he decided to go to Wake Forest. And so he goes to Wake Forest. He gets A's in his class. Uh, he goes into spring camp or uh, training camp. He's ball and he's playing good. He's getting reps with the first team. The second team as a freshman is cool. And then he calls us and he says, Dad, Mom, he goes, I like this, but I don't love it. And he goes, you know, when I look at my life, I want to study abroad and I want to learn foreign languages and I want to leverage international business for the gospel. Like, I'm ready to retire. Me and his mom was like, okay, come home. Let's do that. You believe that's what God's saying to you? We support you 100%. You know why? Because when he was a little boy, I got down on one knee and I grabbed his face and I said, son, no matter what you do in your life, your father loves you and I support you. Well, guess what? When Jesus hung on the cross, God the Father extended his arms and said, son, daughter, I love you and I want to give you a calling and I want to give you a life. I want to give you a happiness rooted in you being a peacemaker that when people see your life and when they see your tombstone, it says, beloved son or daughter of God, known for making peace. <clears throat> Let's pray, family. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you for each of these students. I don't know their names, but Lord Jesus, you know them. You know every hair on their head by name. I want to pray that the words that have been spoken would be like arrows moving deep into the souls of men and women, calling to life who they are in you. Lord, we need a generation of peacemakers. We need a generation that seek your face. We need a generation that love you. We need a generation to depend upon you. I believe that this is the generation. So the Father in the matchless and most beautiful name of Jesus, make it so you will complete the good works that you started. And right now in this moment, I think it's about four or five of you, maybe seven or eight, who have heard the gospel, who've gone to this great school, but today it's like the light switch has turned on and you're ready to follow Jesus. If that's you right now in the silence of your heart, this is what I want you to do. I want you to say this to him. He's here. His nail-pierced hands are extending. Today is the day that you bow your knee to King Jesus and you receive him as a peace offering. You receive his grace. In the silence of your heart, you say this to him. King Jesus, today I say yes to your invitation. I say yes to your forgiveness. I say yes to your cross. I say yes to your resurrection. I say yes to new life. In your glorious name and God's people said, Amen. Let, let's give God a round of applause. He's awesome.